Hi, my name is Jim Pandry. I've been involved in the health and fitness industry for about 18 years. And over that time, I've had a chance to really figure out how to help myself as well as my friends and my family. And so that's the purpose of this video is to help you understand how you can be more fit, have more energy, and how you can just feel as great as possible. So most people at one time or another in their life have tried health products and have had kind of results where I think I feel better but I'm not sure, where they never really noticed anything and there's several reasons for that. Because most of us, when we, when we look at, at the tons and tons of books that we can purchase and, and read, which I've been reading books for years and taking in seminars, um, and you, you find that most of the books, like, it gives you a neat idea but it's never complete. I've never found a book yet that was totally complete as far as um, everything I need to know to be healthy. It's always focused on one thing and what happens is most people look at the body in a metaphysical sense where if, if you give it XYZ nutrients everything will be okay and it doesn't necessarily work like that. What I've learned over the years is that, that there's a few things going on and so when we take our, our basic nutrients So we have our, our, our core nutrients that our body needs and from there we subtract, um, we'll call them bad foods and beverages. And those are the things like coffee and alcohol and chocolate and sugar and preservatives, um, artificial sweeteners, smoking, things like that. Things that we know are very, very bad for us. And the next part is we subtract um, foods that we have a really tough time digesting. So we'll just call those um, um, basic foods. And just to give you an idea on that is let's say 80% uh, of the population have sensitivities to wheat, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. It's very hard to digest. And so a lot of people have food sensitivities to foods that they eat on a daily basis, but they're so used to experiencing how they feel with these foods in their life that they don't know anything different and you have to take them out before you'll actually understand, wow, this is how I feel without those. And so by the time you have your core nutrients, you subtract this and this, equals how much energy you have left over. So that, that's a core. So let's say, um, looking at this, so you buy some vitamins and you buy some ginseng or something and you add this into your diet, but when you still got all these things left in there, is it possible for you to really notice much? Not really, because you're not going to the cause of the problem. Now the, the next part of it is, is where we take a look at, at the specific nutrients. Now there's specific nutrients that the Chinese, for example, took 5,000 years to figure out. So they, they, they figured out what foods are on your digestive system shopping list and your circulatory system shopping list and your immune system shopping list. Um, so they, could, they knew what foods to, to provide the body every day so it could be strong and healthy. We're over in the West, we, we eat for taste. We, we look at our food choices as, wow, I like green peppers in my salad and I like you know, this and I like that and that's how we make our choices. We're over there, they focus on what food does instead of how food tastes. And so over there they have these system specific foods. And so this will decide whether or not your body will regulate or regenerate. And what regenerate means is when, let's say you cut yourself and it heals. And we're just used to this, but the, the thing that you can take that to a much farther extreme where why can't your body fix its liver and why can't it fix its large intestine and why can't it fix its pancreas and its immune system, etc. And it can. And that was one thing that our body can do that the Chinese figured out is that your body can regenerate itself of almost anything. Where in the West we assume we have to go to the doctor to achieve that and take medication and allow something else to fix us. And so this is the major thing that people need to understand to become healthy. So I, I want to draw you a picture. It will take you to, a, to the next level. It starts off by um, understanding that how different uh, health conditions um, are affected by something else. So for example, here's your nervous system. And so that's a nerve and that's the myelin sheath that goes around the outside. 
And often in a case like Parkinson's disease and MS and MD and fibromyalgia and Lou Gehrig's disease, etc., there is an attack of some sort on your nervous system. And so the attack is coming from somewhere. Where is it coming from? Um, you know, it kind of looks like that. And it'll just come through there and it'll just chop those, uh, your, your nerves right off, which stops the flow of, uh, of communication that goes through those nerves. Now, and it, that could show up as, uh, as, um, as like vibrating tremors, could show up as the, the loss of a limb, of, of being able to use it. Uh, it shows up as in many, many areas. Um, but it's coming from the organ that goes right before that, which is the spleen. The spleen. And your spleen tells your T-cells what to do. And your T-cells are what attacks foreign cells that come into your body. That's part of your immune system. And you don't want them on your bad side. So your spleen tells your T-cells what to do. And if your spleen is, all, is totally full of toxicity and not functioning properly, it starts giving your T-cells garbled messages. And they can attack your joints, like in MS, and they can attack your nerves and many of these diseases. And also, when your spleen is so full of toxicity, because it's the end, it's the tail end of your filter system, then toxicity starts slipping past the spleen as well, and that starts uh, raising a major havoc with your nervous system. And that also goes through there and severs that off and just stops the communication. So this is where the, the problem of the nervous system is. So can we take a pill for the nervous system and get it to work? Not really, not until we deal with the spleen. And the spleen didn't have a problem all by itself. It took something else feeding it before it got that way. And it's fed by your circulatory system. And it's also fed by your lymph system, which it's the tail end of. So your lymph system is, there's as much fluid in that as your blood system. And your lymph system is fed by your colon. And so our, our large intestine looks well, a little bit different than that, but there's a, there's a small intestine and a large intestine. And our nutrients are absorbed from our small intestine, especially up into our liver, like that. And it also comes from the large intestine. And the lymph system starts filtering right here before it even gets to the liver. So it's from your portal vein. And so now this is, this is what your lymph system is filtering. And so you're getting the toxicity through this way to the spleen and you're also getting it from your liver. And, this, and it, it, it's a combination of toxicity from what you eat, from what you absorb through your skin, and the toxicity that comes from your colon. And, and just so you know, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but there's 78 chemicals that come from the rotting mass that sits in your colon, and especially undigested protein. And so we're talking chemicals like alcohol and methane gas and formaldehyde. Those are produced right in your own colon. And for people who don't think this is real, um, if you ever seen the show Blazing Saddles where they're sitting around the fire, they're burning their gas, like that's a real thing. I've seen people burn their gas before. It burns a bright blue flame. And this is produced in your own, your own body and it doesn't just go into the atmosphere, it's absorbed up into the body and so it starts toxifying the body. And the, the, the poor uh, the digestion is, the worse it is. But the thing is, is that this is a problem, but why is it a problem? It's a problem because something else has a problem and that is your stomach. Poor digestion with low digestive enzyme has a very difficult time breaking down your food and the more undigested food you have, especially your proteins, it comes through here and it just layers. It layers in your colon and just sits there and rots and ferments. So it all goes back to the digestive system and why is the stomach weak? The stomach is weak because of your diet. So health is not that simple but yet it's very predictable. It's very predictable if you do certain things it's going to fall apart. If you do certain things it's going to be great. It's as simple as that. So this is how this works. Here's your stomach. And here's a small intestine and there's your large intestine. And there's nine stomach busters we call them. And they are coffee, regular tea, alcohol, sugar, chocolate, um, salt, 
preservatives, artificial sweeteners, and tobacco. And so those are the nine busters. And to add to that, we've got prescription drugs and things like aspirin and also stress. So those are the things that are the hardest on your stomach. And we know that, you know, too much coffee, yeah, your stomach's not going to feel well. Too much alcohol, your stomach's not going to feel well. Too much of any one of those things will make your stomach feel uncomfortable because it shocks it. And so if the stomach was, for, was, was working uh, perfectly, it would have lots of digestive enzyme. And with lots of digestive enzyme, it has lots of mucus to protect itself from the acid. And they've established that by age eight, many children's stomachs have already gone into shock and have already become weakened by just a, a constant sugar and chocolate and, and uh, most of these things in here. And it's, it's just sad that they eat so much crap and it really does have an effect. Because a lot of people think they could just, you know, eat crappy one day and then the next day they're totally get a brand new start again, but it doesn't happen that way. It's an accumulation. And by age 40, most of us are right down with very, very little digestive enzyme. And so with the less acid you have, the stomach makes less mucus. Why make a whole bunch of mucus if you just got this piddly little bit of acid in your stomach? And so for years, I used to think I had an over acid stomach and this is what was happening. So you've got this little bit of acid, a little bit of mucus, and then you'll have some chocolate, you'll have a beer, you'll have a coffee, uh, you'll have uh, you know, a, an orange or a tomato, something that's acidic and it immediately dries up stomach acid, but then there's no protection so it irritates the walls of your stomach and your stomach, it, it spasms so it tightens. It squishes. So it squishes this solution up into the esophagus where there's no mucus at all and so then we feel the burning up in here. So at that moment, it's like, wow, I have an over acid stomach so I'm reaching for an antacid. So I had Tums and Rolaids everywhere, right? All my vehicles had them and the washing machine was full of them, they're everywhere. I had to have them to survive. And and that's why I, I struggled with this. Now your stomach is, um, it goes through your diaphragm which is fastened to your ribs and it kind of pokes up through there and your esophagus here is fastened to your lips. And so as it tightens, it, it's struggling against this diaphragm and the whole thing is, is tightening so something needs to give here. So it's like, you know, it's either going to suck your head down, you know, which doesn't usually happen or your stomach starts pulling up through this uh, diaphragm and so it gets a bulge up in there. And that's what a hiatus hernia is. And it stretches that valve out of place in there so it, to the point where you can lay down at night and the acid can run right into your throat. And so this is where this problem comes from. So now some people could say, well, I have a genetically short esophagus so it had to, my stomach had to stretch up through this diaphragm for it to, to work. But of course that's not true. People did it on their own with, with their diet. Now, sometimes people don't experience this to a great extent, but they do notice a pressure in here, but they notice more problems elsewhere. Because the biggest problem that comes from this, from low digestive enzyme, is, is you're not digesting your foods properly. And so what happens then is your foods start passing down undigested, especially your proteins. They're the hardest to break down. So as they start passing down into, through the intestines and your liver, is absorbing these nutrients up into itself so that it can transfer it into your bloodstream and it'll pick up these chunks of protein that were supposed to be emulsified but now they're being absorbed up in a chunk and that's where your food allergies come from and a food allergy specialist will tell you that it's always the protein in the food that your body reacts to and why is your body reacting to a protein? Because you don't have the digestive enzyme to break it down. 